Hi, welcome to the Dirt Trail Running Podcast. We're here, here tonight for the Kettle Moraine 100 race recap. And uh, I'll just let everybody introduce herself that's going to be here with us tonight. I'm Sid. I'm Reese. I'm Lloyd. <laughs> I'm Nikki. I'm Crystal. And specifically tonight, we wanted to talk to Reese because he had a really big run at Kettle. And uh, it was pretty interesting to watch and see it all turn down. You came really close to the course record and you were going for it. Yeah, that was the whole goal of the day. So, I mean, you know, like I, I made it pretty clear on my socials that that's what I was going for and elicited the help of Brandy Henry, who was super crucial and just, you know, like course information and helping me exchange bottles where we could and doss me with buckets of water. I think I tried to keep cold and, and wet the entire day. Um, but to come up 15 minutes short, you know, it's kind of bittersweet because I feel like I this is my first year I was able to actually like leave out what I had on the trail. Um in a smart way, you know, like I, you know, looking back, it's like, man, like 15 minutes were there places that I could have made up some extra time. Like, yeah, for sure. In the first 80 miles, I could have pushed some of the hills harder, but who knows how the back 20 miles would have happened, you know? So it's kind of this bittersweet thing of like, and, you know, last year I, I felt like I wasn't able to give it a good hundred percent effort this year. I gave it that hundred percent effort. I came out with a good result and it was just a little bit below, um, you know, Zach Gingrich's. 15, 17, 32. Um, don't call me on that. We just yeah, that's that. right. Like, there, there, yeah. Two seconds. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, it was a great day. It was nothing but success, nothing but learning. Um, and, yeah, I'm very, very grateful for, you know, the community, for everybody that cheered me on, for uh, everybody at the aid stations at Crystal who were just pouring me with water. And, um, yeah, so it's always a well-organized event. And I hear nothing but great things from other runners who come through the aid stations and say they have a blast, too. So thank you from all of us for yeah. – you know, putting on such a great time. Yeah, the volunteers, they really crushed it at the aid stations. And Crystal was at a, at a crucial spot for you heading out into the meadows. Did you take mm -hmm. any aid there? Uh, Quickly. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, yeah, because Crystal was like icing everybody yeah. down. Yeah. I So we joked earlier, but like you doused me with some water and then all I could say was more. more. So I think I said that about more, 20 more. times in the span yeah. of two seconds. It was more, 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 more. <laughs> I was waiting for my bottles to get filled up and I was just like, just keep dumping because yeah. it felt so good. The second that water mm. hits you, like on a hot day in the meadows, it's oh, just yeah. like clarity just sheds on you, you yeah. know? So a uh, good tip for anybody next year, like if you can stay cold or, you know, uh, wet, you know, the entire day go for it so. yeah i've never done the water on me mm -hmm. it always feels weird to me really yeah but maybe i i do ice though in the hat did you do any ice in your hat <clears throat> i did at one aid station and i can't remember who helped me out but they stuffed it in my bandana and like actually put it like in this hat on the top mm -hmm. and then sandwiched it on the top mm -hmm. of my head that was nice. It actually got a little too cold for me. I was like, mm -hmm. this, this icicle is sticking to my scalp now, you know? <laughs> so that was a little too much. But um, I do a lot of training, like, you know, like uh, in the springtime when it's like mud season here, you know, I'll go out on the trails and just be absolutely caked. And on my Instagram is a funny little reel of me actually showering off in one of the streams that's uh, mm -hmm. in Cuba Marsh. Uh -huh. um, so I'm no stranger to getting my feet wet and get getting everything wet and just keep moving forward. So it's kind of one of those things where it's like, I just tune out any unpleasant feelings that happen and just keep going, you know? Yeah. So, I don't personally like my feet wet, but if that's what it's got to be to keep me cool, then let's do it. Yeah. Um, it was, it was fairly hot. I don't know what it was in 2009 when Zach set the course record. Did you change your plans at all for how you were going to manage the course because it was kind of hot and humid? For the first couple of weeks, I did a lot of heat training. Um, you know, I want to say like four to five weeks out is when I started going to um, the sauna like habitually. So like after my long runs, I'd do like a 20 or 24 mile long run. I'd actually run to the gym, which is about a mile away from our house. I would sit in the sauna, built up to about 30 minutes, and then I would just jog back home. So I had that, um, you know, getting in a good workout and then having a good sauna <laughs> session and then still working my legs, coming back home. Um, so I guess like going into the race, like the day or the night before the race, I was just telling myself, like, I prepared for warm conditions, like heat doesn't exist because I prepared for it. So I just kept trying to play these mind tricks on myself of like, Hey, you know what? Like, don't let it phase you. It's going to, it's going to heat everybody tomorrow. Um, you know, it's, it's all good. So yeah, I mean, you know, like I, 
I prepared for it, but um, I mean, besides staying wet all day, that was kind of on the fly. And anybody that knows me, my girlfriend will laugh when she hears this. I don't like getting wet. Like she's a triathlete. She loves, you know, like going out and swimming and doing all that. And she tries to get me into it. And I'm like, I'm a land mammal. I don't, <laughs> I don't particularly like to swim or get wet. So um, yeah, that was kind of on the fly. But um, other than that, I, um, you know, I tried to visualize a hot day out there and how I would handle myself. And um, you know, before the race, I think a lot of problem solving and adaptability comes down to like visualization. Like Coach Scott is great with us with um, just talking through the race and just going through different scenarios in your head. If it's super hot, if it's rainy, like what are you going to do? So when I was sitting in the hot sauna, you know, like with nothing to do but think about my core temperature go up, I was thinking to myself, what's it going to be like to be at 100K in and be exhausted at the start finish near all my friends, near some good food, mm -hmm. near Matt and Danny and still have to go back out for another you know, 38 miles. So, um, running through scenarios like that and like, what do I do when it's really hot? What do I do if it starts raining? What if it's super muddy? What if the day's not going my way? What if my stomach goes South? Um, things like that. Then by the time it comes to the race, like any scenario I've kind of mentally thought through. So I at least have some quick go-to options for, um, for remedies for any of those scenarios that plague ultra runners. You are, I think something that you're so good at is like talking quick to crystal is getting through the aid stations mm -hmm. super smooth. Like even because crystals was a non crew aid station and you still went through there very, very quickly. Oh, yes. very quick. Like, was that something you improved on from last year when you ran the race? For sure. I want to say last year. So I came out with, um, for the, for the website, I came out with an article called raid, uh, aid station Efic efficiency in racing and, and that's on the ordinary meal racing website. yeah yeah and yeah. um loretta actually on our podcast coffee with coaches we talk about this a lot because there's so many pitfalls that an ultra runner can run into at the aid station because they're comfortable mm -hmm. they smell good people are cheering you on there's music there's pickles. people pickles, <laughs> pickles <laughs> juice there's fireball. there's nut butter <laughs> fireball sid's cheering you on yeah. giving, giving his classic <laughs> woo as you go get on the trail um but um where was I going with that? Oh, aid station efficiency. So yeah. yeah, I mean, last year during the race is when I started to build, okay, like when I go into the aid station, I should have my trash in my hand ready to throw mm -hmm. away. My bottle should be unscrewed. I don't carry a lot during these races specifically because I don't want all of these things to be clouding my judgment. I don't want to worry about like, where is my such and such in my pack or where is my trash? Mm -hmm. Or I want to know, okay, I have fruit snacks in my bottles. I have some emergency gels on my waist and I'm gone. So I know that, hey, like anytime I start hearing bells or cheering or whistles or I, if I know an aid station is coming close because I know this course really well, um, you know, it, if I'm not able to see Brandy, if I know she's not going to be there to change out my bottles, <clears throat> I got to have um, lids unpopped and I got to have, uh, I got to tell people like fruit snacks in the bottles, ice and gnarly in the bottles. Um, and then while they're doing that, if I can get soaked, you know, then by the time I'm done getting soaked, my bottles are good to go and I'm off. Mm -hmm. um, I think too, like, uh, I try to go into the aid stations w with like a sense of urgency, like I have a mission, mm -hmm. not like, okay, this is my break point. It's like, this is my, this is a necessary stop that I have to take. So since it's necessary, I have to stop because you can't go on without any more aid, but how do we shorten that stop as, as much as we can? So I think there was one aid station, I think it was horse riders, um, where this little girl, like she was amazing. She was great. She was um, I popped off my bottles. I filled them up. I was like, fruit snacks in the pouches. I got all wet. One bottle was already in my hand. And she was struggling trying to put some fruit snacks in the other. So I grabbed it. I was like, thanks. I'll take it from here. Appreciate it. Thank you. See you later. Bye. <laughs> you know, and I was like running as I was saying goodbye. And I just hope she doesn't think I was a jerk because I took away the bottles while she was, you know, like filling fruit snacks in them. But it's kind of one of those like... I got to start doing these races slower so I, actually, I can actually meet the people at the aid <laughs> yeah. stations, you know, because I would have been loved to be like, hey, thanks. Like, I appreciate it. Like, great job out here. It's good to see you. Thanks for all the help, you know. But I guess, like, a strength of mine would be just singularity and focus. It's like, let's, like, I'm here, but let's get out as soon as we mm -hmm. can, you know. So, um, you know, that's a little bit more, like, mental than some people take these ultras with. So I appreciate both approaches for sure because I love just hanging out in the woods. But if I sign up for a race and I put on my socials, like, hey, I'm going to go for the course record, like, I'm going to try not to stop at all. But if I do stop, I'm going to multitask. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be peeing while I eat or, you know, like, <clears throat> eating while I hike a hill or dousing off if I'm at an aid station while somebody else is filling my bottles. So any way that I can personally streamline that process is – um, it's good for me for sure because I 
am less stressed when I'm actually moving forward. I'm a little bit more, oh, I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go. Mm -hmm. Um, and that can, I mean, any type of like undulation from your baseline, um, emotional state when you're racing can either bring you a little bit too high or a little bit too low. So I know if I kind of have this urgency feel, well, how do I feel less urgent to get down the trail? You yeah. know, cause when I'm running, I'm having a good time. I'm hitting my pace. I'm feeling my effort, but when I'm stopped, I'm like, you know, like, okay, yeah, let's get it going here. <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, that's just how I, how I handle the aid stations. So yeah. I'll go ahead. Um, uh, based on all that, though, um, so were you consistent throughout? Like every aid station was basically the exact same, you know, the, the fruit and the water. Was it just consistent or was there any aid stations where you like changed it up and you had to like um, do something different for like nutrition? Eat, eat real food. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that was it. That was okay. it. I want to say I took in around like 10,000 calories uh, split between fruit stacks, gnarly, a couple spring nutritions. Um, some of their some of their products, um, which were fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, last year it was a little bit more variable. Like I had some fig bars. Um, I had a banana here and there. Um, but through training, like I know that like um, gummies work really well for me because um, they're really easy on your stomach. And if I chew something, I feel like I'm actually eating. It's a psychological mm -hmm. thing where if I'm chewing it, yeah. I'm eating it, I feel not full, but I feel like I'm actually processing something. Yeah. Whereas it'll, some, sa it'll like satisfy mm -hmm. you. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So I know that like on average, uh, fruit snack packets are like 70 to 80 calories. So I think to myself, okay, well, if I have, you know, anywhere from two to four of these an hour, plus I down two of my bottles of gnarly, you know, like I'm going to be around like 300 to 400 calories. And then if I'm a little bit low, maybe, you know, like I'm cl climbing a hill or if my stomach starts to get kind of like, you know, full or um, sloshy, then I'll like slurp a spring nutrition. Um, so my mind works best in these like parameters. Like I don't think to myself, like I need X product, X amount of time at X interval during the race. It's more like, man, okay, well, you know, I wasn't really hungry the past 30 minutes, but I know I should get around two to three fruit snack packets. Okay. I feel like I can crush two right now. So, and then just kind of check off the hours as they go instead of micromanaging myself every 20 minutes, because if I thought about having to think about it, something every 20 minutes or having something beep at me every 20 mm -hmm. minutes, I'd right. be like, well, maybe right now I don't want to eat or yeah. maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe I'm about to like crush this descent and I want to go fast and I don't want to think about pouring fruit snacks in my mouth, like as I go down, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was very consistent. It worked. Of course I have these other, um, other backups to go to, like in case, the fruit snacks are just not palatable or, you know, everybody gets flavor fatigue out there. So I think mm -hmm. changing up the fruit snacks was <laughs> huge, as stupid as it sounds. I mean, you know, going from those red fruity snackies, I don't know what package those were. Um, I think they were fruity snacks. I think I'm just glad called. we, I'm like, as a race director, I'm feeling pressure going, man, I'm glad we had fruit snacks. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember you guys had fruit snacks last year. And if you okay. didn't like Brandy knew that, like I like fruit snacks. So okay. she had some Welch's. So switching back and forth between the Welch's and the fruity, fruity snacks, I, I could really taste the difference. I was like, oh, it's nice to have some Welch's right now. <laughs> Shout out to Welch's. Like, <laughs> thanks. But, um, yeah, so as long as I'm like satisfying that caloric intake and I'm hydrating, I think, you know, liquid nutrition was huge for me. Shout out to Gnarly because mm -hmm. um, I don't have to worry about my sodium intake drinking that. I mean, I have signs and telltales that I need more sodium, like when I'm out on my training runs, um, if I'm just drinking water. But, you know, to be able to get in hydration and get in um, sodium and get in some calories, like you only have so much stomach real estate to be playing with at mm -hmm. any point point in time. So I think, you know, the liquid nutrition for me is going to be um, a bonus going forwards. And I'm really looking forward to using more gnarly because it goes down pretty well. Um, just because you can satisfy all those requirements right there, you know, that's interesting. So, so like you're saying that your stomach can only take so much liquid. So you're much better off getting calories and liquid at the same time, like food and yeah. Liquid. So like we only have so much space in our, okay. your stomach can only expand so far, especially when you're running the capacity to expand is further diminished because your abdominals are contracting your diaphragm has to breathe and, and get air inflow in and out of your lungs. Um, so you have reduced blood capacity to even process a lot of that stuff. So the easier you can make your, your nutrition to process via liquid calories, mm -hmm. Um, the easier it's going to be for you to absorb that energy and to keep moving forward without really thinking about it. So I kind of thought about the liquid nutrition as being kind of like the bonus, like, Hey, let's get like, you know, 
200 to 300 calories of gummy nutrition and then that liquid nutrition is just bonus because it goes down so easily. But if you only have so much space to play with in your stomach, let's say you put in a fig bar, well, that's cool. You just satisfied your, um, your, your hunger requirements, your, your energy requirements, but now you also have to put in some liquid in there. So let's say you put some water and now you have water and you have this solid mass that your mm -hmm. stomach then has to mm -hmm. churn up before it can uh, deliver into the rest of your intestinal tract. So I think to streamline that process and just say like, here's already the calories and the electrolytes and the, um, and the hydration all at once. Like, that's great. And it doesn't have to be gnarly. I mean, any product that works well for you that you test out in training is going to be great, you know? So, oh, and so in the heat, your, so your stomach was okay with the heat this year? Yeah, it was during, during the heat of the year or the, the heat of the day, I was doing a lot more liquid. So at that point, um, I mean, I was drinking like three bottles an hour. Um, so I thought to myself like, Hey, I might be getting a little bit low in calories right now, but if I feel that I'm going to take one of my emergency okay. uh, spring mm -hmm. nutrition. Yeah. So I just kept downing as much water as I could, because honestly at, at every aid station, I couldn't get enough water. I mean, I think at one point, like somebody was dumping water on my head and I just opened up my mouth and started, started laughing it up as they were dunking me. I was, I was like, I'm living like a king. This is great. Um, so yeah, you know, and, and that's where like playing in those parameters really helps me because I don't think like, oh shoot, it's the heat of the day. It's been 20 minutes. I have to be chewing something or get something solid. So, but that's something that I've practiced with in training too. It's like, yeah. hey, let's go on a hot run yeah. and see can I handle this banana? Can I, right. you know, everybody loves, knows I love it. Um, sometimes they just don't work. So, but your hat, but your, um, hat long training runs, you're not like zooming through a station where people are dousing you with water either. Like what, how do you, you do long training runs. Like what, talk about your training a little bit and how, how the heck do you manage all that? So during my training, I like to think about like, you know, there's heat tolerance, and then there is, let's call it like temperature regulation. So like during my training runs, I try to get as much heat tolerance um, adaptation as I can. So if I'm out in the hot sun, like I'm drinking a lot of water, I'm being in the heat of the day, but I purposefully don't try to cool off because I want to get up to that. Like, I don't want to like get heat stroke out there. Right. But I want to get up to the point where I know like, hey, this might be a little unsustainable. So that way I know what that feeling feels like. And I consciously tell myself, I don't want to feel that during the race. So anything that I can do to avoid that during a race mm -hmm. is going to be great. So yeah. I feel like, you know, like um, personal experience is the biggest thing with these races, right? Like how do you run 100 miles? Well, have you run 100 miles before? You know, like that's going to be your best gauge as to like, hey, how do I handle myself? So like as far as temperature goes, how do you handle the heat? Well, have you been to the point where it's too hot for you to run anymore? You, do you know what that feels like? Do you know how to like avoid those circumstances? So I think like for me getting into my training and getting close, getting close to, you know, um, w while still being safe, like I don't want people to go out there and like, you know, suffer heat exhaustion or whatever, but get out there, get warm, see what it feels like to be operating under uncomfortable warm circumstances. Um, and then just that alone will help your body adapt and get better. It'll increase your blood plasma volume. It'll increase your sweat rate. It'll um, help you retain more electrolytes during sweaty, hot, long runs. But then during a race, you, you go into the race with all those adaptations. And now when you specifically try to cool off, now your body is so used to handling hot weather, but you're not getting it up to that point where it's, it's working in that, those, hot, mm -hmm. those type of hot conditions. So you have all the adaptation, but your body doesn't really have to express it on the day because you are regulating your temperature efficiently. And that's where you, know, you do all this heat training going in, but then on the day, you still have to keep cool. You see a lot of athletes do this in Western <clears throat> states that's coming up in a couple of weeks where they'll do sonic uh, runs. They'll do like double layer training runs. Um, they'll do camps out um, on Memorial Day weekend in the canyons and they'll do their heat training. But then on the day, everybody's, you know, soak in themselves, they still have ice. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of that, that, that duality of like, get your body adapted to the heat. So 85 degrees doesn't feel so unmanageable anymore. But then at the same time, you still got to stay cool during the race. Are you going to try to get into Western States? You got a couple, or you got a <laughs> qualifier. I, yeah. I, you know, like I, it's, like, I, I totally get the allure. I totally get the, the history behind it. I think it's amazing. Um, everything. I think, is it Craig Thornley? Yeah, Craig yeah, Thornley. Yeah, Craig Thornley, um, the race director. Um, definitely, like, they do a great job. Um, uh, you see all the pros do it. It's got a ton of allure in the United States and the world. Um, 
but I think the fact that it's so popular, I don't want to put my name in a, a hat because it's taking away from other people that have worked so hard for so many years to get into it. So if I do want to run it, I'll probably try to go for like a golden ticket. Um, and that might be a little like, uh, that might be a pie in the sky, you know, but I think, you know, if that's something that I really want, then I should really put the work in and really try to, you know, uh, ob obtain it that way, you know? So I feel like there's a lot of people that have earned their spot, but haven't necessarily gotten into the race yet for me to want to go and put my name into the hat. Yeah. Well, you earned your your Western States qualifier at Kettle. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited this year for, for Western States. I love following along. I follow, um, I follow the sport pretty well. Um, so yeah, good luck to everybody running Western this year for sure. Yeah. yeah well, we'll be out there. Um, yeah, I think, I think it would be really cool to see you go out there actually. And you could totally get a golden ticket, I don't know what, what all the golden ticket races are, but I think um, Black Canyon 100K would be a fun one. Mm -hmm. I know that's one of them. I think Black Canyon, Havelina 100. I think they added another one. Havelina might be one as yes. well. I'm always pro air bike races. 100K, Canyons 100K, Canyons 100 yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you're thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I follow. I follow a lot. I think, yeah, I, I, I really... I, I love competition. I love being out in the woods. I love training on my own before this year and meeting everybody here at OMR and dating my girlfriend. Like I'd say 99% of my training runs were just on my own. Um, and it's funny because you told me that story of you guys running at Lapham and just seeing, and that's a great example of how there can be a group run happening and I have no idea. I'm just <laughs> out running on my own and all of a sudden I, I see everybody. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's kind of one of those things where, um, you know, like I love being out in the woods. I love being on my own. I love self-sufficiency and having that experience of being a body in an environment under physical duress and having to use your skills to um, proceed and to navigate. Um, but I love competition. So I loved Hennepin last year and just watching Phil Young just take off ahead of me. And it was great. I loved it. Like I love pushing myself. I love being pushed by other people. I love pushing other people. And I love getting smoked and learning lessons. And um, yeah, I'm excited to do Tunnel Hill this uh, later on this year because I'm going to be running with Phil uh, too. So I can't wait to learn some lessons from those people. So long story short, I would love to go out to Western States and just get it handed to me because that's, <laughs> that's the way that you get better, you yeah. know? So, um, you know, I'm game to put in the training and I'm, I'm game to try to cut my teeth against any other competition that's out there and get smoked and learn lessons along the way. And I think that's the best thing about living the lifestyle as well as appreciating and participating in the competition. Yeah. That, yeah that's so really... Reese, can I ask you at some, at some point during the race at mm -hmm. Kettle, did you like know that you weren't going to be able to hit the record and did that change anything for you or did it, I don't know, slow you down, trip you up mentally, mess yeah. you up? Like so, how did you deal with that? So my first goal in any race is to always push myself as hard as I can and make the most out of the day. Um, so although I was absolutely going for the course record just because it started slipping away, mm -hmm. uh, which I knew coming through Highway 12 the second time, um, Brandy Hen Henry, as it was playing out in my mind, she was like, you got to pick it up on the, on the flats, man. Can you push any harder on the flats or something? And I was like, nope, record's not <laughs> happening today, mm -hmm. but I'm going to push as hard as I can to the finish. Um, that might not have been verbatim, but that was, that was so what I, 14 miles before the finish. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's what I told her as I was going through. And I knew that about like 10 miles prior to that too. I want to gotcha. say it was probably mile. Cause you're already pushing yourself as hard as you can. Right. Yeah, yeah. It was already mile like 75 <laughs> or 80. But the hard thing is, is that you're always conserving just a little bit because there's nothing ever guaranteed in a hundred mile. You mm. push too hard 20 or 30 miles and you might not feel it until mm. mile 70, 80, 90, yeah. 95. Last year, I got passed by Michelle. Wait, like lasagna, Maganya. Maganya. Yeah. Michelle Maganya. Um, I got past it like mile 90 or 91 or something like that. I think it was just, road. Yeah, yeah. She passed me with authority, and I knew I was going as fast as I could, and I could not catch up. So when she passed me, I was just like, yeah, you go, you know? Yeah. But um, since I knew that was the, the record was still out, I told Brandy, I was like, I'm not – like I'm, I'm pushing as hard as I can to the finish. I think I even told Brandy because I thought she was going to see Deanna at the end before before I did. I didn't know if I would see Brandy or not after that. My, my thinking was going kind of mm -hmm. fuzzy. 
Um, so I told her, I, I said, when you see Deanna, let her know that the record's out of the books, but I'm going to still push hard for a really strong finish. So I always got to satisfy that, like, push as hard as you can on the day of, n no matter what. In, um, in an Instagram post I wrote, um, there, there, there's two points where you can see exactly where the second place is behind you, and that's at 100K coming back into Nordic, mm -hmm. and then that's at, um, that's at Rice Lake at about mile 80. So as I came back in, I looked at my watch and I started timing as I went back out and waited till I saw another 100-mile runner. I kept looking at everybody's bibs, right? So um, as I saw him, I looked at my watch and I saw about 15 minutes. So I was like, cool, well, I have 30 minutes on him because he's got to go there and back. So that's when I started to turn that really competitive thinking on instead of thinking like, okay, operate within myself, run my race, uh, do my strategy, um, don't blow up on the hills, things like that, keep my food, my hydration in. Now at 100K, I'm thinking, I got 30 minutes up on him. Let's just start every couple hills that I would be hiking. Let's just keep in a little canter, you know? So because even like a little canter, a little trot up a hill going 13, 14 minutes a mile is going to be faster than hiking at 16, 18, 20. Just probably what you're thinking that's what he's going to be doing. Yep. So, so just every, keeping those couple minutes. Every hill I thought to myself, every hill that I was hiking, I thought to myself, okay, before I would hike this, I'm going to run this one. I'm going I'm, I'm to keep a run. So I'm thinking to myself, if he's going to hike this, I'm going to run it. And then by the time I got back out to Rice Lake and I came back, um, I timed him again. And I had, um, and his, his name's Brian Simonic. Uh, yeah. S Simonic. Yeah. Great guy. I've been exchanging some conversation with him on Facebook. Um, but uh, I think it was then about 20 minutes up. So I was like, okay, cool. I put 10 minutes extra on him. And then I just kept thinking like from Rice Lake all the way to the end, it's, pretty technical but it's not super hilly until you hit nordic so i was like i'm gonna run everything everything i was hiking wow. before and then by the time i got to nordic you're about like five six miles out especially mm -hmm. after you pass tamarack mm -hmm. i went through tamarack because i just stopped at bluff and i thought to myself you know what i got enough calories i have enough water even if i drain all my water i'm so close to the finish that i'm not mm -hmm. going to dehydrate and keel over so now every single hill and there's a couple walls coming back into nordic mm -hmm. i was i was running all of them you wow. know so i kept thinking to myself like yeah, my legs are tired. Like my knees feel like they've ran 90 miles plus. Um, but there's nothing extreme or there's nothing extreme about the pain that I'm feeling. It's just ultra fatigue. It's ultra pain. It's being out there for a long day. So I'm going to keep plugging away because everybody's experience, experiencing this right now. So how, how bad do you want it? You mm -hmm. know, if everybody's experiencing this, then why don't I push a little bit harder if I can? So that's where my competitive thinking kind of yeah kind of came back that, that's so interesting because it's uh sally mccray had made a kind of a similar comment after she did coca 250 mm -hmm. where she you know her race kind of changed because of her feet and all that but then she's like her competitive edge came out and it was uh, she's yeah. like uh, it's past gap and berry everyone mm -hmm. you're you know yeah. to just do that and like that's literally what you just said and that's i you know i, I saw her finish line <laughs> Her, her celebration, which was, oh amazing. It was yeah. amazing. It was so cool. I love to see people celebrate after things like that. Like no matter, no matter where you are at in the race, like celebrate. Cause it is a, it is a hell of a finish to get to the end of any ultra. Um, and everybody's got their own battles to, to fight out there. So like celebrate as much as you can yeah. when you get to mm -hmm. the end. Cause who knows how many of these we have in us, but yeah. So uh, once I knew that the record was kind of out, um, Brian really gave me something to, chew on for the last 20 miles because it, it's 20 miles out of 100 mile right so it's like oh you're almost done but no you still have like a long run <laughs> right, plus yeah. on some pretty technical trails <laughs> with nordic coming at you so it's like you know you still have like a couple hours of thinking out there so um you know knowing that he was right behind me and even exchanged a couple funny comments you know as i passed him a few times um you know gave me something to chew on and think like okay cool let's 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 bury it let's leave it out there let's put him put him behind us um it sounds really competitive and cutthroat, but like, you know, I think like I love to see everybody else push themselves super hard. So I also love to push myself super hard. So, um, yeah, I mean, like he, he ran by all means, he ran a phenomenal race start to finish. I think he's in the top, top 10 leaderboard too. Um, for, for yeah, it yeah. was his first hundred. Yeah. And he learned from you. He listens to your podcast. Oh, awesome. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. <laughs> so, yeah, um, you know, he skateboards and plays guitar, too. So we yeah. kind of come from a similar background. And um, he messaged me something because he, 
he made a post on Facebook that was like, you know, time to get back on the board after, you know, like uh, training and, and running this 100. And I was like, yeah, man, like I rolled my ankle like, couple, like a week before Kettle last year, um, you know, and he goes, I know I read in your Ultra Runner magazine, so I stopped skating two weeks beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we reached one person. That's awesome. <laughs> so, but yeah, um, yeah, so that's kind of like, what my thought process was, even though the record was out, it's like, let's just hammer the rest of the day as hard as we can. Cause we didn't get to 80 miles thinking, um, might as well lock it in now, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. I think it's really good to, to celebrate the competitive. Cause I think that no matter what, you know, what speed we are, we can be competitive. Like if I'm running a race, even if, you know, I'm going to finish in eight hours for a 50 K or something, I still am going to want to race the person that's in front of me. Mm -hmm. It gives you a Mm -hmm. good motivation. And I don't think that we should apologize for that. I think that's good. I mean, that's helps us be the best that we can be. I think it's an absolutely healthy amount of respect for the sport, respect for the people and respect for the fact that everybody's out there trying to push themselves as hard as they can. So if you were the person helping somebody else push themselves or, you, you know, you are pushing yourself or you're pushing somebody else, like, by all means, go for it. I mean, you know, like leave it out there on the trail, but I think it's some FDR quote that's like, you know, like when you step into the arena, you're, you're playing the game, you know? So if, I, if, if you cross that starting line, like this is, a, this is a race. This is what we sign up for, you know? So how you decide to race that race is, is up to you. If, if you want to go for time, if you want to go for competition, if you want to go for um, age group, or if you want to go for fun, like that's awesome. And all of those um, motives should be celebrated for sure. You were saying before we went live that um, you would love to talk to Zach Gingrich that had the course record. Yeah. Oh, so if he's listening right now, <laughs> I want to get you on the other podcast because I want to like, you know, I want to dive into his training about yeah. like, hey, like he was smoking all the races in the area, like from 2008, 2009 to like 2013, 14, 15. I mean, like, you know, I know him from the kettle record because I've had my eye on it for a couple of years now. Um, but you know, I did sign up for, um, or I'm, I'm looking at, um, this planes, this is that, is that how you say it? The plane? The DPRT? Yeah. Yeah. Planes. yeah. The, the 50 mile there. And like, I saw his name up again. Uh-huh. So then like, I'm clicking into his profile and I'm looking at all of his races. I'm like, Badwater 135, like all these. So yeah, he was a monster. So I just wanted he to just know. He just won everything back <laughs> then. And then he just disappeared. So anybody know him? It is, <laughs> no. It's not just like him winning things. It's that his records are still stand like 10, yeah. 15 years later. And they're still tough for anybody to grab or even come close to. So. You came very close. So I don't mm. know if we've said your time. So you, did we say it? No, it's 15, 32, 43. So what, what pace is that? Like an eighth? So it averaged um, nine minutes and 20 seconds. And I think his was nine minutes and 11 seconds per mile. And that's, that's average pace. So I don't, I don't know what the moving time would have been. It would have yeah. been a little bit faster. Mm-hmm. But I do know that I had about 10 minutes of stopping time for pouring water in my head. So huge shout out to Brandy Henry for... The whole um, race, 10 minutes? Yeah. Wow. wow. Um, yeah. So I mean, you know, besides getting water dumped on my head, having a few age station stops, moving up once, um, I peed three times... Those were all in the 10 minutes. Wow. I want to get that down, too. It was like 20 minutes. I feel like there's more than 10 10 aid stations. Yeah, so Brandy Brandy was trading my bottles. There was a lot of aid stations that that, that I didn't stop. I dropped my bottles. She gave me bottles. They were loaded with fruit snacks, and I just kept going. Okay, nice. Um, So all the crude aid stations, you were able to do that. For sure. Cool. Yeah, so there were a couple aid stations that I skipped. I skipped Tam going out the first time, Tam coming back. I stopped at Tam once in the middle as you were, like, mile, like, 65, 68, mm-hmm. yeah. something like that. Um, so I skipped Rice Lake because Brandy crewed me there. I skipped Highway 12. She crewed me there. Um, I stopped at Horse Riders. But most of my stops, I tried to keep under like 30 seconds or so. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know? In my splits, in my, in, my, in my strategy for the day, I, I wanted to go for a 15-hour pace. But I knew that, okay, if I can keep my aid station stops to under 15 minutes, then I'm really running a 14.45. Uh-huh. So I figured out that'd be like an 8.51 average per mile with 15 minutes of eight station stops in there. If anybody's wondering how they can plan their next race, yeah. it's a great way to do it. Nope. Um, because <laughs> your, your, your moving time is not your elapsed time. So yeah, that's right. something to, to think about for sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, I really came 30 minutes away from what was my goal. Um, so, but, you know, compared to last year, like, like I was talking, I, um, I mentioned before we started recording that last year. I, on May 21st, um, was my first run back after having COVID. So I was laid off for like a week. I did a Grand, the Grand Canyon trip. 
um, like three or four weeks prior. Um, for anybody who wants to read about that, I think the link is in my Instagram. Um, so I was pretty fatigued coming out of that, just having COVID. I was really just trying to get my wheels back underneath me. And um, I rolled my ankle skateboarding the, the, the week beforehand. So I remember running like mile three with Devin Yanko and like all of a sudden I hit this rock and my ankle kind of turns a little bit and it's like, whoa, mm. there it comes. Don't yeah. let that happen again. And yeah. of course it does about 20 more times during the course of a hundred mile or so. To be able to come back this year without COVID, without the rolled ankle and actually feel like, you know, I was able to plan the race. I was able to execute um, fairly well. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's as, as good as I can hope for. So I, I definitely feel like I had a good year out there, but um, you know, there's definitely lessons to learn. Like I, I went into this year thinking that, you know, I'm going to work a lot on my speed. Because last year I did a lot of volume. I did a lot of slow aerobic. And, um, you know, like this year I was like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to train my half marathon. I'm going to get my 5K time down. I'm going to incorporate a lot of speed. I did these blocks where I did some speed sessions. A day after that I did a long run. The next day I did another, like, slower speed session and then another long run just to kind of fatigue the legs and, and go out there nice and long. But what I didn't have was any runs over about 50K. So, you know, me learning, you know, I, I think I would have had a little bit more staying power if I would have like thrown in like a 50 mile run or like a hundred K at least like two months prior just to get the legs, um, kind of used to being out there for a yeah. long time, you know? So, but that's where like Galena is going to be a good option for next year for right. anybody that's looking to run kettle, <laughs> like hit up the eight hour and just get on your feet for eight hours and see what it feels like to navigate and you know, this year it was pretty hot too. I think it was hotter at Galena than it was at Kettle just because there's a lot more exposure there. Um, so yeah, um, that would be my takeaway for next year for sure. I hope that, oh, so you are going to do it next year. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's tentative. Like we'll see Like Deanna and I want to do, um, we want to do Potawatomi. Um, we want to do some, some kind of distance there. We're yeah. thinking about, um, you know, the ice age 50, um, love your, your, your races, Michelle, like they're fantastic. Um, but there's a lot of good, out there yeah, we, you got to try everything so, in the Midwest. Yeah, so we'll but, see. If I don't come back and race next year, like I would love to come back and like either crew or volunteer or come back in a different capacity and just kind of like give out, give give some of my time. For, sounds like you want to mark the course next year. Yeah. <laughs> that would be so much fun. We get it done really quick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I gotta be. I gotta perfect my flag gun so you can just run and yeah. shoot down. Yeah. <laughs> That sounds good. Although I do think that you have a course record in you and like, you know, you definitely have this, the talent and the drive to train, um, to be able to do that. And it would be so fun. We had, we've had the women's course record broke now and it's time. It's been around for a while (laughs) and we need it broke. (laughs) That's, That's what I'm hoping for. And I mean, you know, like somebody like, uh, there's a great quote out there. I don't know who to attribute it to, but, um, you know, wins what is it? wins wins are owned but records are borrowed and that's you know a good way of saying that like hey you know like um you go out there you set a record you know it's not going to be there forever so i mean like me knowing going into this like hey let's say i do get the record you know then like somebody follow me up next year i don't want to see it stick around for 15 years otherwise this sport's getting stale yeah. you know so let's inject some speed let's get some young guns in there and let's 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 shake up the Midwest a little bit. I think so. Um, whether it's me or somebody else, like Kyle. Kyle's got huge potential. I yeah. think last year or next year he's gonna crush my my Galena time from this year. So you know, let's hope he does the four hour, or the eight hour, and just you know smokes that one and sets another bar. So yeah, yeah. Shout out to everybody out there that's looking to you know set the bar high and shoot for some big goals because I love seeing my athletes. You know, like call out their shot and want to go for their goals and lay down the hammer and do everything that they can to make it happen. Yeah, it's good seeing the um, all the talent and w- with all the coaches at Ornery Meal Racing really helping people get to their best and setting goals like that. But I'm so excited to see Midwest talent specifically and um, getting stuff done that people are noticing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We need more of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm excited about Kyle. I think that he... <clears throat> The way he ran Galena was really smart. He reminded me of you when you first started. And, uh, you know, just, you know, like, well, he said what his goal was. And I'm going, wow, that's a pretty yeah. happy goal. Yeah. <laughs> but then he almost did it. So, and that, and I kind of knew you a little bit before and knew that you were capable. And he just kind of surprised me. So that was 
it's really that. different sports when you're coming from. I think he's like tracking cross country yeah. in, mm-hmm. in college, you know, and then to step into the ultra game, like you got so many more variables thrown at you. It's a completely different paradigm for training. Not completely different, but you know, there's different highlights in training than if you were going to run like a smoking fast 5k, 10k, or even marathon, you know, and, and really the, the 50 mile and hundred K distance is a different sport than the hundred mile distance. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. um, you know, for him for to, sure. mm-hmm. you know, almost hit that goal and mm-hmm. be so close and be so young and still have so many lessons to learn. Like once he like just dials things in a little bit, you know, through experience and through talking with people and hanging around you a little bit more, like, you know, um, he'll learn quick and he'll be, he'll be smashing things up if he sticks with it and is hungry for sure. Yeah, he's he's smart too. I invited him to run the 50k because I thought it'd be interesting. Because I figured he just did a long run at Galena, and he's like, "Nope, coach says no." I'm like, "Wow," because <laughs> some people don't listen to the coach. Most <laughs> he's he's yeah, cool. well, that's good. And then I mean, yeah, there was there's a lot of great women talent, but then Brian um, Simonic. I think Simonic. Uh, I haven't said it out loud. So um, Simonic, Simonic. Simon Nick, Simon Nick, we'll have to ask him. Um, that was his first ultra, period. Like yeah. his first thing on ultra sign up. Wow. And it was 100 mile. He did it in 16, 27, 57. And so he signed up for Midwest States and Hennepin okay, awesome. this year. So, And I think that just goes to show like, you know, like uh, – if you don't have a lot of experience and you're looking to get into the sport and you're looking to just, shake things yeah. up, just just jump to the hundred. Just jump to the hundred. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Skip every just, yeah. You never know. Don't listen to anybody. Oh Go for the hundred. <laughs> Be a student of the sport. You know, he was reading Ultra Running Magazine. Um, you know, he was probably online. He was probably listening to podcasts. He was out there researching the event, and you know, like be a student of the sport. Learn as much as you can because. I mean, like the body can only tolerate so much training, but there's still so much to do psychologically, strategically, um, and you know, gaining more knowledge about the course is huge. I mean, you know, like I running at the start, I remember yelling at somebody. I think it was one of James's friends. I can't, I can't remember who was right behind me. Um, James might know, but um, I was telling him, I was like, man, I grew up and went to Kettle Moraine High School, man. Like, we're proud of the kettles. Like, I, before I even knew that, like Kettle Moraine 100 was a thing. Like, I was out hiking those trails and, um, you know, uh, about like three or four years before running Kettle 100, my little sister for Christmas, she got me this big rock and she carved my initials into it. And um, we went through and we, we tossed it at my favorite section, which we run past on the Kettle Marine 100. So it was great as we went past that section. I, you know, like yelled at her in my head. I was like, <laughs> love you, Kaya, you know. Like, um, so having that type of course knowledge and knowing exactly what's going to come up ahead of me and where the prairies are and, and where the technical parts are and um, just things like that really help you set your efforts from the start, which is huge because you don't want to go out with a blazing 5K if you're running a 100-mile race. Yeah. It mean, doesn't matter how fast you go at the beginning. It matters what your 100-mile time is. Yeah, yeah, like as fast as you're going, you're running at what, you know, it feels easy for you where you're, or, you know, you're not like pushing yourself. It's as, it, it would be equal to somebody else. Like even though you're doing like an eight minute mile, it might be somebody else doing. And that's, that's fourteen. That's, I always talk to my athletes. That's why I'm a firm believer that rate of perceived exertion is king. You know, yeah. like everybody's like my seven out of ten is going to be your seven out of ten. The velocity might change, right, mm-hmm. depending on aerobic conditioning or anaerobic conditioning. Um, but that intention is, you know, how it is stressing the system is the same. So. Um, you know, like your mind as in RPE stands for rate of perceived exertions. So that's your body's own internal capacity to understand how much stress am I under right now? Um, that has, your brain's making so many calculations of like how much glycogen is in your muscles, how much glucose is in your blood, what is your motivation? Um, you know, how about muscular damage, core temperature, um, things like that, that your watch isn't calculating your heart rate, all those things. Um, so I think, for me and my athletes, what I always try to tell them is like, you're going to get to this point in a race where your rate of perceived exertion might stay the same, but your velocity is going to drastically change just because of how much fatigue your body is under. So I think being able to get in touch with that rate of perceived exertion during your training is amazing because technology will always fail us. But if you can understand like, Hey, I might be going slow for the first couple miles here. Well, that's fine because maybe you're climbing 4,000 foot in the first five miles, like at Wasatch, you know? So um, or maybe you're going really fast and your RPE is really low and it's like, Hey, well, maybe you're, you're screaming down like a negative two or 3% incline and like, cool, you can afford to make a little bit of time up, um, as long as your quads can handle the pounding and things like that. So I think, 
um, you know, getting in touch with that during training is going to be huge. And that's going to be a great long-term um, developer for anybody's um, athletic career, you know, is to be able to think to themselves, how hard am I actually working right now? Um, for me, during the 100 mile, I wasn't working all that hard for a lot of it besides maybe the last like 30 miles once I decided to keep pushing. Um, of course, you feel um, bodily aches and pains, right? Like everybody feels the runner's knees, everybody feels the runner's hips, you know, like my arms were kind of tired from carrying my bottles. Um, but, you know, you should still be able to tell yourself like, okay, how hard am I breathing right now? How hard am I actually working? So you do handhelds. Yeah. Two handhelds. Yeah, that was my race strategy because um, I, you know, I knew going in it was going to be hot and I kind of, I really don't like wearing a vest just because it's another thermal layer, right? Like mm -hmm. it's another thing to trap heat. Um, sure, it's another thing that can get wet and can stay wet and help you evaporate and cool. But most of the time I'm doing my training runs anyways, I'm just in the woods alone without a shirt, with two bottles in my hands. <clears throat> it's great. I love it. So I'm comfortable that way. Yeah. Um, so that's the way that, um, that I do race. But I did tell myself if it was going to be below 75 degrees that I would start um, I would start training with my vest more because having more carrying capacity, if it's cooler out, would definitely be a plus just so you don't have to stop quite as much. Mm -hmm. If I could have just skipped all those aid stations that I stopped at um, and just relied on what was on me, like I probably could have made at least a couple minutes, you know, which, I mean, sounds negligible when you're talking about a 100-mile run, but when you come 15 minutes away from your goal, like all those things are playing in my mind of like how could I have done that better. Although I think like a handheld's easier to get through an aid station because it's easier for anybody can fill a handheld. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Everybody's <laughs> pack is completely different mm -hmm. for changing water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that would, unless you did bottles in the well, front. What I, what I was thinking was running with handhelds and doing the best. Mm -hmm. Because oh, okay. I would be able to carry a lot more nutrition. Like mm -hmm. I have like an Ultra Spire waistband and it's great for stuff in gels. Maybe if I want my phone in the back or whatnot, but you know, you can't carry a, a vast amount um, to at least be comfortable like skipping a lot of aid stations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, only having to refill your vest once during a race would require, you know, like a couple thousand calories worth of gels that you can't carry on a waistband, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, carry a lot. I love that band. It's an amazing band. I've been using the same one. Well, I used the same one this year as I did for Kettle last year. And I think I had it like two years before I ran Kettle wow. last year. So things old, but it's still trucking. Um, so yeah, that was my strategy. It was two handhelds. I had the buffer around me because I knew if it was hot, I wanted to get that thing wet and just have it kind of drip on me continuously. Um, I had this hat because I love this hat. Thank you so much. I still have a sticker on it because we're going to keep this thing nice and fresh for as long as we can. Um, but um, yeah, other than that, um, I had some I had some shoes that I trained in. I had um, some ordinary mule socks. And like I said, I, I, I'm not like, I don't try to be a minimalist, but I try to think about how can I eliminate these things that I have to think about, you know? So if I'm carrying a lot in my vest and I'm thinking where's the trash where did I stuff that you know mm -hmm. like wh what like no in my in my bottles I have the trash pockets it, fruit snacks go in there too and then springs along the waist and that's it you know yeah. so but um yeah but that's where like everybody's different and I always tell people like that's my strategy but it might not be your strategy most likely won't be your strategy yeah you know Lloyd, you're newer to the sport. What what have you learned from Reese? Everything. <laughs> Everything. Yeah. I'm just I'm just soaking it all in. Yeah. And this is a little bit more, you know, like neurotic than maybe like a lot of people would get in their ultra runs. Like, go out there, like have fun. Like I'm talking about this like it's like life or death, you know what I mean? But you know, like when I sign up for a race, like I want to push myself, I want to push other people around me. But, you know, during training, like I would say 80 to 85% of my training is just going out, logging in some miles, going where I want to go, going to a forest preserve, running flat if I want to run flat, going on the hills if I want to. Veteran Acres is awesome for getting some elevation change. Um, you know, you can also run flat there too. So um, people that follow me on Strava might see that I do a lot of road miles too. And, you know, it's like you got to fit it in where you can and, you know, make the road as fun as you can if you have to do it. Like I only get like an hour to run Mondays and Wednesdays when I'm at work. So I try to stick to the roads or to Cuba Marsh. It's pretty flat, like a, a nice flat gravel trail. Um, but try to have fun with it out there, you know, and then every once in a while, one, maybe two days a week, think about like, hey, what do I have coming up on the calendar? And how is this session going to prepare me for that? You yeah. Know? So otherwise go out there, collect heartbeats, like have fun, like, you know, eat some food while you're out there so that you know what you're going to like on a race day, like drink some hydration and some calories so that you know what's going to go down well on race day and, you know, 
um, get out there and have a good time. You um, mentioned your Instagram. What's your Instagram handle? I think just my first dot last, but my last is crazy. Oh, we can so look at that. Let me spell it. R-E-E-S-E dot S-L-O-B-O-D-I-A-N-U-K. That's what it is? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now you need to say it. Slobodianuk. Wait, say it again. Slobodianuk. Slobodianuk. <laughs> we had a sit, we <laughs> sat there at the end with um, your by blood cousin, yeah. Yeah. Trisha, right? And she had us, she taught it to us, but now I forgot. <laughs> Oh, she was there at the end? She yeah, said that she, she, she was she was super. <laughs> yeah. okay, oh, there, cool. yeah. there's an underscore. Good. So it's oh, Reese underscore. with an underscore. Okay, underscore, I'm sorry. Um, it's the podium. It looks like They'll this. Find you. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody that's watching, because we've we got could, this on YouTube. We and, can put a link in the description. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. can put a link, too. But yeah, Maybe you get one or two followers. So right. much knowledge to <laughs> to learn from you, and mm -hmm. then and then you guys do a podcast on on is it Thursdays? So you do it live on Facebook, right? Yeah, so we do it live on Facebook, and then it comes out on YouTube, and then um, it comes out on the podcast or on on Spotify, and I think Apple too. Yeah, uh, a, a day later. So those are always fun. Loretta and I um, just talk about training, and that's where we kind of like nerd out on like how do you prepare for things like this, you know? Because I mean, like. For people that don't want to think, like, I love thinking about this. It, you know, ultra running, like, you know, satisfies my love to be outside, my love for competition, my love for strategy and planning and my nerdy logistical sciencey background, you know? Um, so I love doing that and planning and looking at um, elevation profiles and talking with athletes about like, hey, you might be living in rural Illinois, but let's train you to go run a stage race out in, uh, out in Colorado. So shout out to Ryan, who's about to take on a good challenge in a couple months here. Um, if he listens to this, he'll, uh, he'll get a kick out of it. But yeah, so I mean, like, you know, with a little bit of planning and forethought, like you're not really limited as to what you can achieve, you know? So, but if you don't want to think about it, listen to our podcast and you can get some good ideas or hire a coach because, you know, like most of us love just talking about this and bantering about it anyways. So, yeah. So there's ornery meal <clears throat> racing podcast. So listen to Reese and coach Loretta to learn and if you want to hear about the party listen to me and because <laughs> 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 that's what we do that's our jam, for sure. <laughs> so is there anything else that we want to talk about so thanks everybody for tuning in and tune back in for more kettle party stuff so thanks everyone congratulations Reese yeah. thank you guys <laughs>